Hey everyone, welcome to The Drive Podcast. I'm your host, Peter Atia. Peter, welcome to another AMA. How you doing? Feeling good, man. How's the heat out there? Um, I, I, I don't mean to sound like that guy who's like just too cool for school, but it's just not phasing me and people just can't stop complaining and I don't know why. And, and, and it's interesting because I'm normally the, my nickname in uh, one phase of my life, maybe it was residency or medical school, my nickname was Bubble Boy because like if it was below 72 or above 76, it must've been med school. Um, <clears throat> I was like, yeah, it's just, it's just too cold or too hot. I've, I've, California does that to you though. Like you just get in those bubbles and anything outside of that feels good. You I mean, you saw it in San Diego, right? 60 degrees and people would be in North faces walking around. Well, my thermostats definitely clicked to the much higher end. I'm, um, again, we'll probably talk about rucking, but rucking, I always pick the hottest time of day to do it. So usually about somewhere between four, 5 PM and it's just moved my thermostat higher. So nothing, you know, it's been 106, 107 every day for as far back as I can remember. And it's looking like it's going to be that as far forward as I can see. Um, but I was in California, um, three, four weeks ago and I had dinner with a friend. We ate outside. I was in a t-shirt and I was freezing and it was about 65. I, I thought I was going to die. I mean, it wasn't that bad, but I was amazed at how cold I felt. So clearly I've lost my, you know, comfort level at the extreme low end of temperature. Yeah. The Canadian in you is just sad to hear that. Just the freezing cold at 65. <laughs> Unbelievable. And, and, and yeah. Okay. Well, <laughs> so be it. <laughs> um, all right. So I think what we're going to do for this AMA is the last AMA, what we did is we took a lot of questions and answered it, looking at the various literature to understand some of the confusion around if there's such a thing as too much exercise. But what we weren't able to do is with all the exercise content we've been putting out lately, we've gotten so many just follow-up questions. Coming off the last AMA, what we thought is it'd be a good time to just do a little more rapid fire style of those questions, not necessarily a heavy deep dive and just really look at answering kind of all these different questions around exercise. And so I think that's what we're gonna do today. We'll, we'll kind of, if all goes well, we'll cover all four pillars of questions that have come in. And so it should be kind of a good, well-rounded AMA on all things exercise. There should be something for everybody. So before we get to the first question, anything you wanna to add to that? Nope, I think that's a great framework. Perfect. So I think the first question is just to set the stage, it may be again talking about like what you view as your goal with exercise. So what you've mentioned before is, you know, training for the centenarian decathlon. So maybe just give people a really brief rundown of what that is and why you think it's so important for you as you look at your longevity journey. So the centenarian decathlon, which I, I think many people listening will have heard me talk about is simply a mental model for how I think about training in all of my years of training, which have basically been my entire life since I've been 12 or 13 years old, a couple of things appear clear to me. And by the way, this is true of not just my own training, but the training I've been involved with for uh, other people, athletes, and this includes you know professional athletes, Olympians, things like that. Specificity matters, right? And people confuse specificity with narrow. That's not the case. So I want to elaborate on these two things. Um, you can be broadly trained and broadly conditioned, but with specificity and focus. And as we'll see in a moment, that's really what the centenarian decathlon is all about. You can be narrowly focused with great specificity that's what certain types of athletes are doing, right? So if you're a golfer, if you're the best golfer in the world, there are some really, really specific things that you need to be doing. By the way, they're highly asymmetric, right? You know, depending if you're right or left handed. Um, <clears throat> and, you know, your training is basically focused on enhancing those very, very specific movements and probably some training to counterbalance the asymmetry there. Um, so 
in my experience, it's very difficult to be successful in a physical endeavor if you are not uh, pursuing some sort of objective. So the um, I'm just going to work out strategy doesn't really produce great results over the long haul. And it certainly doesn't when you're trying to solve a complicated problem. So even if you could convince me that, no, 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 the just work out for the sake of working out is, 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 is better than sitting on a couch, I would say you're absolutely correct. But now we're going after a really hard problem, which is to be in the last decade of your life, what we call the marginal decade, and be incredibly robust physically. Um, what does that look like? Well, I, I think it means imagine a 90 year old who's functioning like a 70 year old. And I, I think that's attainable, right? So I'm not talking about 90 year olds functioning like 20 year olds. I think that's science fiction. But I am talking about 90 year olds functioning like 70 year olds or 85 year olds functioning like 65 year olds. But that is going to require a lot of preparation, as we'll talk about later. When you think about the inevitability of decline of muscle mass, strength, cardiorespiratory fitness, you have to be training for that with the same degree of focus and specificity that you know a person is training for to be an exceptional athlete in their 30s or 40s. So the centenarian decathlon basically forces us to be specific in what our metrics are in that last decade of life. And it allows us to backcast from there because forecasting from wherever you are today will almost without exception fail to get you where you need to go because you'll end up missing the mark by slipping underneath it. Instead, you want to start with where you need to be at the very end and work your way backwards. And almost everybody, myself included, is unpleasantly surprised with how far they are today from where they need to be to allow the decline that's going to take place to take them to their resting spot at the end. Yeah. No, I mean, I think that that all makes sense. And we'll look at some graphs later on that I know you show patients, which I think do like when I saw them, it did a really good job of explaining why when you look at that rate of decline, where you start at matters so much. And it kind of reminds me of the recent bone density episode we did too, when we looked at those graphs with, if you didn't reach your full potential compared to if you did reach your full potential in bone density, like your fall off looks very different. And we see the same with a lot of this exercise, which I think is, it's going to be really interesting when we get to it. But I think what might be helpful is maybe just showing people how you're currently kind of structuring your program um, to train for the Centenarian Decathlon. So in the last AMA, we kind of talked about met hours per week as a way to standardize looking at different literature. So do you maybe want to walk people through your current structure and how you break that out to ensure you're not just focused on one piece, but focused on the broader picture? Yeah. I mean, I, I'm, <clears throat> you know, my exercise is not really geared towards the things it used to be geared towards. So if you look at how I exercise today and compare it to how I exercised, call it eight years ago, when I was very focused on one specific thing, which was time trialing, you know, type of bike racing. If you compare it to where it was, I don't know, call it 14, 15 years ago, where it was really, you know, very, very focused on marathon swimming. Uh, again, pretty niche and specific thing. You know, the training that I was doing 15 years ago versus eight years ago had zero overlap. Similarly, if you look at what I'm doing today, it it would not produce a good cyclist. It would not produce a good swimmer. You know, the, the, that's just not the way it is. So it's, it's really focused on something different. So, I mean, I think my training kind of fits into four or five buckets, right? I have my zone two, my zone five strength stability and i kind of lump them together even though they're very specific and and you know there are some very specific stability things i'm doing and and they're not necessarily strength related in the um in the moment and then i include rucking in there because it is so physical although truthfully like my what drew me to rucking was actually more the psychological benefit of it but you know it's as anybody who's 
done it knows it's it's quite demanding if you make it if you allow it to become demanding and you you and we talked about this you've joined me on a rock i mean you you can see like between the temperature the elevation change and the weight um you know it's it's quite a it's quite a lot of work so that's how i kind of organize myself and as you said you know you can sort of identify how many mets are required for each activity, how much time you spend in each, the dot product of that gives you met hours per week. And then you can sort of get a sense of where your energy is going. Cause that's, that's probably the purest way to understand energy expenditure across those domains. All right. So Peter, that makes sense. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to share a slide we put together kind of of a table that you broke out of kind of what your current met hours per week are. If you want to walk people through what it is and then also how you're thinking about it. Yeah, so this is back of the envelope, um, but you know, as I said, really straightforward, right? So zone two cycling, and my zone two is you know somewhere between two hundred and twenty and two hundred and thirty five watts. So I kind of took a slightly lower estimate and just said, just let's average two hundred twenty five watts, and you can you can use a calculator to tell you how many mets that is. Um, so that's 11 Mets. And if I spend four hours a week there, 11 times four, 44. So that's 44 Met hours per week. Zone five, I do via cycling and stair climbing, <clears throat> and that's about 16 Mets. So now I'm really pushing the intensity, but I'm only spending half an hour a week at that intensity. So you can see that's only giving me eight Met hours per week. Um, lifting weights is, uh, about an average of five Mets. So some things are less, some things are more. It also depends greatly on um, other things that go in there. So, <clears throat> you know, all the time I'm on an air bike and doing kind of some, you know, more intense stuff in there would be at a much higher Met. Whereas, you know, doing a bicep curl <laughs> is at a lower Met. But it, we've looked at a bunch of papers and I think our best estimate is I'm probably averaging about five Mets, um, which is really not that labor intensive, uh, but you multiply that by six hours per week, there's 30 Mets. And then <clears throat> it, the best data I could find was, um, rock, you know, lo looking at military personnel rucking, uh, it says 50 pounds there. I do use about 60 pounds or 55 to 60 pounds. So you can get a sense of if you're at 0% uh, grade, it's 4.8 Mets. If you're at 5% grade, 7.5, if you're at 10% grade, 10 Mets, um, when I kind of look at my heart rate data, when I do it, plus the elevation change, I think I'm probably averaging 6.5 Mets. I do three, usually closer to four hours per week. So maybe that's a bit of a conservative estimate of, you know, call it 20 Met hours per week. So directionally, you total that up and you can see, okay, it's about 100 Met hours per week of activity. There's the breakdown by percent where they are. And <clears throat> we'll come to this in a minute, but I want people to notice the relative amount of zone two to zone five. Right. So, um, my zone two is five times, slightly more than five times the, not just the duration, but more importantly, it's eight times the duration, but it's five times the, the met hour. So the, the aggregate intensity, the integral intensity, and that's going to become an important point when we start to talk about how you would partition your time between zone two and zone five. Yeah. No, that makes sense. And it kind of leads into a good question that we got, which is, you know, one of the things we see a lot is what do we know about whether moderate intensity exercise is as good as vigorous intensity exercise? So we do see a lot of questions that people are kind of wondering how they should think about, you know, that moderate versus vigorous intensity as they look at their cardio work. Thank you for listening to today's sneak peek AMA episode of The Drive. If you're interested in hearing the complete version of this AMA, you'll want to become a member. We created the membership program to bring you more in-depth exclusive content without relying on paid ads. Membership benefits are many, and beyond the complete episodes of the AMA each month, they include the following. Ridiculously comprehensive podcast show notes that detail every topic, paper, person, and thing we discuss on each episode of The Drive. Access to our private podcast feed, 
The Qualies, which are a super short podcast, typically less than five minutes, released every Tuesday through Friday, which highlight the best questions, topics, and tactics discussed on previous episodes of The Drive. This is particularly important for those of you who haven't heard all of the back episodes. It becomes a great way to go back and filter and decide which ones you want to listen to in detail. Really steep discount codes for products I use and believe in, but for which I don't get paid to endorse and benefits that we continue to add over time. If you want to learn more and access these member-only benefits, head over to peteratiamd.com forward slash subscribe. Lastly, if you're already a member, but you're hearing this, it means you haven't downloaded our member-only podcast feed where you can get the full access to the AMA and you don't have to listen to this. You can download that at peteratiamd.com forward slash members. You can find me on Twitter, Instagram, and Facebook, all with the ID Peter Atia MD. You can also leave us a review on Apple Podcasts or whatever podcast player you listen on. This podcast is for general informational purposes only and does not constitute the practice of medicine, nursing, or other professional healthcare services, including the giving of medical advice. No doctor patient relationship is formed. The use of this information and the materials linked to this podcast is at the user's own risk. The content on this podcast is not intended to be a substitute for professional medical advice, diagnosis, or treatment. Users should not disregard or delay in obtaining medical advice from any medical condition they have, and they should seek the assistance of their healthcare professionals for any such conditions. Finally, I take conflicts of interest very seriously. For all of my disclosures and the companies I invest in or advise, please visit peteratiamd.com forward slash about, where I keep an up-to-date and active list of such companies. Mm-hmm.